Chapter 50 The unmarked Fiat sedan departing Castel Gondolfo snaked downward through the Alban Hills into the valley below. In the back seat, Bishop Eringarosa smiled, feeling the weight of the bearer bonds in the briefcase on his lap and wondering how long it would be before he and the teacher could make the exchange. 20 million euro. The sum would buy Eringarosa power far more valuable than that. As his car sped back toward Rome, Eringarosa again found himself wondering why the teacher had not yet contacted him. Pulling his cell phone from his cassock pocket, he checked the carrier signal. Extremely faint. Cell service is intermittent up here, the driver said, glancing at him in the rearview mirror. In about five minutes, we'll be out of the mountains, and service improves. Thank you. Eringarosa felt a sudden surge of concern. No service in the mountains? Maybe the teacher had been trying to reach him all this time. Maybe something had gone terribly wrong. Quickly, Eringarosa checked the phone's voicemail. Nothing. Then again, he realized, the teacher never would have left a recorded message, he was a man who took enormous care with his communications. Nobody understood better than the teacher the perils of speaking openly in this modern world. Electronic eavesdropping had played a major role in how he had gathered his astonishing array of secret knowledge. For this reason, he takes extra precautions. Unfortunately, the teacher's protocols for caution included a refusal to give Erin Garosa any kind of contact number. I alone will initiate contact, the teacher had informed him. So keep your phone close. Now that Eringarosa realized his phone might not have been working properly, he feared what the teacher might think if he had been repeatedly phoning with no answer. He'll think something is wrong. Or that I failed to get the bonds. The bishop broke a light sweat. Or worse. That I took the money and ran. Chapter 51 Even at a modest 60 kilometers an hour, the dangling front bumper of the armored truck grated against the deserted suburban road with a grinding roar, spraying sparks up onto the hood. We've got to get off the road, Langdon thought. He could barely even see where they were headed. The truck's lone working headlight had been knocked off center and was casting a skewed sidelong beam into the woods beside the country highway. Apparently the armor in this armored truck referred only to the cargo hold and not the front end. Sophie sat in the passenger seat, staring blankly at the rosewood box on her lap. Are you okay? Langdon asked. Sophie looked shaken. Do you believe him? About the three additional murders? Absolutely. It answers a lot of questions, the issue of your grandfather's desperation to pass on the keystone, as well as the intensity with which Falk is hunting me. No, I meant about Vernet trying to protect his bank. Langdon glanced over. As opposed to? Taking the keystone for himself. Langdon had not even considered it. How would he even know what this box contains? His bank stored it. He knew my grandfather. Maybe he knew things. He might have decided he wanted the grail for himself. Langdon shook his head. Vernet hardly seemed the type. In my experience. There are only two reasons people seek the grail. Either they are naive and believe they are searching for the long-lost cup of Christ. Or? Or they know the truth and are threatened by it. Many groups throughout history have sought to destroy the grail. The silence between them accentuated the sound of the scraping bumper. They had driven a few kilometers now, and as Langdon watched the cascade of sparks coming off the front of the truck, he wondered if it was dangerous. Either way, if they passed another car, it would certainly draw attention. Langdon made up his mind. I'm going to see if I can bend this bumper back. Pulling on to the shoulder, he brought the truck to a stop. Silence at last. As Langdon walked toward the front of the truck, he felt surprisingly alert. Staring into the barrel of yet another gun tonight had given him a second wind. He took a deep breath of nighttime air and tried to get his wits about him. Accompanying the gravity of being a hunted man, Langdon was starting to feel the ponderous weight of responsibility, 
the prospect that he and Sophie might actually be holding an encrypted set of directions to one of the most enduring mysteries of all time. As if this burden were not great enough, Langdon now realized that any possibility of finding a way to return the keystone to the Priory had just evaporated. News of the three additional murders had dire implications. The Priory has been infiltrated. They are compromised. The Brotherhood was obviously being watched, or there was a mole within the ranks. It seemed to explain why Sonia might have transferred the keystone to Sophie and Langdon, people outside the Brotherhood, people he knew were not compromised. We can't very well give the keystone back to the Brotherhood. Even if Langdon had any idea how to find a Priory member, chances were good that whoever stepped forward to take the keystone could be the enemy himself. For the moment, at least, it seemed the keystone was in Sophie and Langdon's hands, whether they wanted it or not. The truck's front end looked worse than Langdon had imagined. The left headlight was gone, and the right one looked like an eyeball dangling from its socket. Langdon straightened it, and it dislodged again. The only good news was that the front bumper had been torn almost clean off. Langdon gave it a hard kick and sensed he might be able to break it off entirely. As he repeatedly kicked the twisted metal, Langdon recalled his earlier conversation with Sophie. My grandfather left me a phone message, Sophie had told him. He said he needed to tell me the truth about my family. At the time it had meant nothing, but now, knowing the Priory of Cyan was involved, Langdon felt a startling new possibility emerge. The bumper broke off suddenly with a crash. Langdon paused to catch his breath. At least the truck would no longer look like a Fourth of July sparkler. He grabbed the bumper and began dragging it out of sight into the woods, wondering where they should go next. They had no idea how to open the cryptex, or why Sonia had given it to them. Unfortunately, their survival tonight seemed to depend on getting answers to those very questions. We need help. Langdon decided. Professional help. In the world of the Holy Grail and the Priory of Sion, that meant only one man. The challenge, of course, would be selling the idea to Sophie. Inside the armored car, while Sophie waited for Langdon to return, she could feel the weight of the rosewood box on her lap and resented it. Why did my grandfather give this to me? She had not the slightest idea what to do with it. Think, Sophie. Use your head. Grandpa is trying to tell you something. Opening the box, she eyed the cryptex's dials. A proof of merit. She could feel her grandfather's hand at work. The keystone is a map that can be followed only by the worthy. It sounded like her grandfather to the core. Lifting the cryptex out of the box, Sophie ran her fingers over the dials. Five letters. She rotated the dials one by one. The mechanism moved smoothly. She aligned the discs such that her chosen letters lined up between the cryptex's two brass alignment arrows on either end of the cylinder. The dials now spelled a five-letter word that Sophie knew was absurdly obvious. G-R-A-I-L Gently, she held the two ends of the cylinder and pulled, applying pressure slowly. The cryptex didn't budge. She heard the vinegar inside gurgle and stopped pulling. Then she tried again. V-I-N-C-I. Again, no movement. V-O-U-T-E. Nothing. The cryptex remained locked solid. Frowning, she replaced it in the rosewood box and closed the lid. Looking outside at Langdon, Sophie felt grateful he was with her tonight. P.S. Find Robert Langdon. Her grandfather's rationale for including him was now clear. Sophie was not equipped to understand her grandfather's intentions, and so he had assigned Robert Langdon as her guide. A tutor to oversee her education. Unfortunately for Langdon, he had turned out to be far more than a tutor tonight. He had become the target of Bezu Fock. And some unseen force intent on possessing the Holy Grail. Whatever the Grail turns out to be. Sophie wondered if finding out was worth her life. As the armored truck accelerated again, Langdon was pleased how much more smoothly it drove. Do you know how to get to Versailles? Sophie eyed him. Sightseeing? No, I have a plan. 
There's a religious historian I know who lives near Versailles. I can't remember exactly where, but we can look it up. I've been to his estate a few times. His name is Lee Teabing. He's a former British royal historian. And he lives in Paris? Teabing's life passion is the grail. When whisperings of the Priory Keystone surfaced about 15 years ago, he moved to France to search churches in hopes of finding it. He's written some books on the Keystone and the Grail. He may be able to help us figure out how to open it and what to do with it. Sophie's eyes were wary. Can you trust him? Trust him to what? Not steal the information? And not to turn us in? I don't intend to tell him we're wanted by the police. I am hoping he'll take us in until we can sort all this out. Robert, has it occurred to you that every television in France is probably getting ready to broadcast our pictures? Bezufoc always uses the media to his advantage. He'll make it impossible for us to move around without being recognized. Terrific, Langdon thought. My French TV debut will be on Paris as most wanted. At least Jonas Fockman would be pleased. Every time Langdon made the news, his book sales jumped. Is this man a good enough friend? Sophie asked. Langdon doubted Teabing was someone who watched television, especially at this hour, but still the question deserved consideration. Instinct told Langdon that Teabing would be totally trustworthy. An ideal safe harbor. Considering the circumstances, Teabing would probably trip over himself to help them as much as possible. Not only did he owe Langdon a favor, but Teabing was a grail researcher, and Sophie claimed her grandfather was the actual grandmaster of the Priory of Sion. If Teabing heard that, he would salivate at the thought of helping them figure this out. Teabing could be a powerful ally, Langdon said. Depending on how much you want to tell him. Falk probably will be offering a monetary reward. Langdon laughed. Believe me. Money is the last thing this guy needs. Lee Teabing was wealthy in the way small countries were wealthy. A descendant of Britain's first Duke of Lancaster, Teabing had gotten his money the old-fashioned way, he'd inherited it. His estate outside of Paris was a 17th-century palace with two private lakes. Langdon had first met Teabing several years ago through the British Broadcasting Corporation. Teabing had approached the BBC with a proposal for a historical documentary in which he would expose the explosive history of the Holy Grail to a mainstream television audience. The BBC producers loved Teabing's hot premise, his research, and his credentials, but they had concerns that the concept was so shocking and hard to swallow that the network might end up tarnishing its reputation for quality journalism. At Teabing's suggestion, the BBC solved its credibility fears by soliciting three cameos from respected historians from around the world, all of whom corroborated the stunning nature of the Holy Grail secret with their own research. Langdon had been among those chosen. The BBC had flown Langdon to Teabing's Paris estate for the filming. He sat before cameras in Teabing's opulent drawing room and shared his story, admitting his initial skepticism on hearing of the alternate Holy Grail story, then describing how years of research had persuaded him that the story was true. Finally, Langdon offered some of his own research, a series of symbolic connections that strongly supported the seemingly controversial claims. When the program aired in Britain, despite its ensemble cast and well documented evidence, the premise rubbed so hard against the grain of popular Christian thought that it instantly confronted a firestorm of hostility. It never aired in the States, but the repercussions echoed across the Atlantic. Shortly afterward, Langdon received a postcard from an old friend, the Catholic Bishop of Philadelphia. The card simply read, At 2, Robert? Robert, Sophie asked, You're certain we can trust this man? Absolutely. We're colleagues, he doesn't need money, and I happen to know he despises the French authorities. The French government taxes him at absurd rates because he bought a historic landmark. He'll be in no hurry to cooperate with Fock. Sophie stared out at the dark roadway. If we go to him, how much do you want to tell him? Langdon looked unconcerned. Believe me, 
Li Tibing knows more about the Priory of Sion and the Holy Grail than anyone on earth. Sophie eyed him. More than my grandfather? I meant more than anyone outside the Brotherhood. How do you know Tibing isn't a member of the Brotherhood? Tibing has spent his life trying to broadcast the truth about the Holy Grail. The Priory's oath is to keep its true nature hidden. Sounds to me like a conflict of interest. Langdon understood her concerns. Sonier had given the cryptex directly to Sophie, and although she didn't know what it contained or what she was supposed to do with it, she was hesitant to involve a total stranger. Considering the information potentially enclosed, the instinct was probably a good one. We don't need to tell Teabing about the keystone immediately. Or at all, even. His house will give us a place to hide and think, and maybe when we talk to him about the Grail, you'll start to have an idea why your grandfather gave this to you. Us, Sophie reminded. Langdon felt a humble pride and wondered yet again why Saumir had included him. Do you know more or less where Mr. Teabing lives? Sophie asked. His estate is called Chateau Villette. Sophie turned with an incredulous look. The Chateau Villette? That's the one. Nice friends. You know the estate? I've passed it. It's in the castle district. Twenty minutes from here. Langdon frowned. That far? Yes, which will give you enough time to tell me what the Holy Grail really is. Langdon paused. I'll tell you at Teabing's. He and I specialize in different areas of the legend, so between the two of us, you'll get the full story. Langdon smiled. Besides, the Grail has been Teabing's life, and hearing the story of the Holy Grail from Lee Teabing will be like hearing the theory of relativity from Einstein himself. Let's hope Lee doesn't mind late-night visitors. For the record, it's Sir Lee. Langdon had made that mistake only once. Teabing is quite a character. He was knighted by the Queen several years back after composing an extensive history on the House of York. Sophie looked over. You're kidding, right? We're going to visit a knight? Langdon gave an awkward smile. We're on a grail quest, Sophie. Who better to help us than a knight? Chapter 52 The sprawling 185-acre estate of Chateau Villette was located 25 minutes northwest of Paris in the environs of Versailles. Designed by François Mansart in 1668 for the Count of Offlay, it was one of Paris's most significant historical chateaux. Complete with two rectangular lakes and gardens designed by Le Noter, Chateau Villette was more of a modest castle than a mansion. The estate fondly had become known as La Petite Versailles. Langdon brought the armored truck to a shuddering stop at the foot of the mile-long driveway. Beyond the imposing security gate, Sir Lee Teabing's residence rose on a meadow in the distance. The sign on the gate was in English, private property. No trespassing. As if to proclaim his home a British island to itself, Teabing had not only posted his signs in English, but he had installed his gate's intercom entry system on the right-hand side of the truck, the passenger's side everywhere in Europe except England. Sophie gave the misplaced intercom an odd look. And if someone arrives without a passenger? Don't ask. Langdon had already been through that with Deeping. He prefers things the way they are at home. Sophie rolled down her window. Robert, you'd better do the talking. Langdon shifted his position, leaning out across Sophie to press the intercom button. As he did, an alluring whiff of Sophie's perfume filled his nostrils, and he realized how close they were. He waited there, awkwardly prone, while a telephone began ringing over the small speaker. Finally, the intercom crackled and an irritated French accent spoke. Chateau Villette. Who is calling? This is Robert Langdon, Langdon called out, sprawled across Sophie's lap. I'm a friend of Sir Lee Teabing. I need his help. My master is sleeping. As was I. What is your business with him? It is a private matter. One of great interest to him. Then I'm sure he will be pleased to receive you in the morning. Langdon shifted his weight. It's quite important. As is Sir Lee's sleep. If you are a friend, 
then you are aware he is in poor health. Sir Lee Teabing had suffered from polio as a child and now wore leg braces and walked with crutches, but Langdon had found him such a lively and colorful man on his last visit that it hardly seemed an infirmity. If you would, please tell him I have uncovered new information about the Grail. Information that cannot wait until morning. There was a long pause. Langdon and Sophie waited, the truck idling loudly. A full minute passed. Finally, someone spoke. My good man, I dare say you are still on Harvard Standard Time. The voice was crisp and light. Langdon grinned, recognizing the thick British accent. Lee, my apologies for waking you at this obscene hour. My manservant tells me that not only are you in Paris, but you speak of the Grail. I thought that might get you out of bed. And so it has. Any chance you'd open the gate for an old friend? Those who seek the truth are more than friends. They are brothers. Langdon rolled his eyes at Sophie, well accustomed to Teabing's predilection for dramatic antics. Indeed I will open the gate, Teabing proclaimed, but first I must confirm your heart is true. A test of your honor. You will answer three questions. Langdon groaned, whispering at Sophie. Bear with me here. As I mentioned, he's something of a character. Your first question, Teabing declared, his tone Herculean. Shall I serve you coffee, or tea? Langdon knew Teabing's feelings about the American phenomenon of coffee. Tea, he replied. Earl Grey. Excellent. Your second question. Milk or sugar? Langdon hesitated. Milk, Sophie whispered in his ear. I think the British take milk. Milk, Langdon said. Silence. Sugar? Teabing made no reply. Wait. Langdon now recalled the bitter beverage he had been served on his last visit and realized this question was a trick. Lemon. He declared. Earl Grey with lemon. Indeed. Teabing sounded deeply amused now. And finally, I must make the most grave of inquiries. Teabing paused and then spoke in a solemn tone. In which year did a Harvard scholar last outrow an Oxford man at Henley? Langdon had no idea, but he could imagine only one reason the question had been asked. Surely such a travesty has never occurred. The gate clicked open. Your heart is true, my friend. You may pass. Chapter 53 Monsieur Vernet the night manager of the Depository Bank of Zurich felt relieved to hear the bank president's voice on the phone. Where did you go, sir? The police are here, everyone is waiting for you. I have a little problem, the bank president said, sounding distressed. I need your help right away. You have more than a little problem, the manager thought. The police had entirely surrounded the bank and were threatening to have the DCPJ captain himself show up with the warrant the bank had demanded. How can I help you, sir? Armored truck number three. I need to find it. Puzzled, the manager checked his delivery schedule. It's here. Downstairs at the loading dock. Actually, no. The truck was stolen by the two individuals the police are tracking. What? How did they drive out? I can't go into the specifics on the phone, but we have a situation here that could potentially be extremely unfortunate for the bank. What do you need me to do, sir? I'd like you to activate the truck's emergency transponder. The night manager's eyes moved to the low jack control box across the room. Like many armored cars, each of the bank's trucks had been equipped with a radio-controlled homing device which could be activated remotely from the bank. The manager had only used the emergency system once, after a hijacking, and it had worked flawlessly, locating the truck and transmitting the coordinates to the authorities automatically. Tonight, however, the manager had the impression the president was hoping for a bit more prudence. Sir, you are aware that if I activate the low jack system, the transponder will simultaneously inform the authorities that we have a problem. Vernet was silent for several seconds. Yes, I know. Do it anyway. Truck number three. I'll hold. I need the exact location of that truck the instant you have it. Right away, 
sir. 30 seconds later, 40 kilometers away, hidden in the undercarriage of the armored truck, a tiny transponder blinked to life. Chapter 54 As Langdon and Sophie drove the armored truck up the winding, poplar line driveway toward the house, Sophie could already feel her muscles relaxing. It was a relief to be off the road, and she could think of few safer places to get their feet under them than this private, gated estate owned by a good-natured foreigner. They turned into the sweeping circular driveway, and Chateau Villette came into view on their right. Three stories tall and at least 60 meters long, the edifice had gray stone facing illuminated by outside spotlights. The coarse facade stood in stark juxtaposition to the immaculately landscaped gardens and glassy pond. The inside lights were just now coming on. Rather than driving to the front door, Langdon pulled into a parking area nestled in the evergreens. No reason to risk being spotted from the road, he said. Or having Lee wonder why we arrived in a wrecked armored truck. Sophie nodded. What do we do with the cryptex? We probably shouldn't leave it out here, but if Lee sees it, he'll certainly want to know what it is. Not to worry, Langdon said, removing his jacket as he stepped out of the car. He wrapped the tweed coat around the box and held the bundle in his arms like a baby. Sophie looked dubious. Subtle. Teabing never answers his own door, he prefers to make an entrance. I'll find somewhere inside to stash this before he joins us. Langdon paused. Actually, I should probably warn you before you meet him. Sir Lee has a sense of humor that people often find a bit strange. Sophie doubted anything tonight would strike her as strange anymore. The pathway to the main entrance was hand-laid cobblestone. It curved to a door of carved oak and cherry with a brass knocker the size of a grapefruit. Before Sophie could grasp the knocker, the door swung open from within. A prim and elegant butler stood before them, making final adjustments on the white tie and tuxedo he had apparently just donned. He looked to be about fifty, with refined features and an austere expression that left little doubt he was unamused by their presence here. Sir Lee will be down presently, he declared, his accent thick French. He is dressing. He prefers not to greet visitors while wearing only a knife shirt. May I take your coat? He scowled at the bunched-up tweed in Langdon's arms. Thank you, I'm fine. Of course you are. Right this way, please. The butler guided them through a lush marble foyer into an exquisitely adorned drawing room, softly lit by tassel-draped Victorian lamps. The air inside smelled antediluvian, regal somehow, with traces of pipe tobacco, tea leaves, cooking sherry, and the earthen aroma of stone architecture. Against the far wall, flanked between two glistening suits of chain mail armor, was a rough-hewn fireplace large enough to roast an ox. Walking to the hearth, the butler knelt and touched a match to a pre-laid arrangement of oak logs and kindling. A fire quickly crackled to life. The man stood, straightening his jacket. His master requests that you make yourselves at home. With that, he departed, leaving Langdon and Sophie alone. Sophie wondered which of the fireside antiques she was supposed to sit on, the Renaissance velvet divan, the rustic eagle chlorocker, or the pair of stone pews that looked like they'd been lifted from some Byzantine temple. Langdon unwrapped the cryptex from his coat, walked to the velvet divan, and slid the wooden box deep underneath it, well out of sight. Then, shaking out his jacket, he put it back on, smoothed the lapels and smiled at Sophie as he sat down directly over the stashed treasure. The divan it is, Sophie thought, taking a seat beside him. As she stared into the growing fire, enjoying the warmth, Sophie had the sensation that her grandfather would have loved this room. The dark wood paneling was bedecked with old master paintings, one of which Sophie recognized as a Poussin, her grandfather's second favorite painter. On the mantel above the fireplace, an alabaster bust of Isis watched over the room. Beneath the Egyptian goddess, inside the fireplace, two stone gargoyles served as andirons, their mouths gaping to reveal their menacing hollow throats. Gargoyles had always terrified Sophie as a child, 
that was, until her grandfather cured her of the fear by taking her atop Notre Dame Cathedral in a rainstorm. Princess, look at these silly creatures, he had told her, pointing to the gargoyle rain spouts with their mouths gushing water. Do you hear that funny sound in their throats? Sophie nodded, having to smile at the burping sound of the water gurgling through their throats. They're gargling, her grandfather told her. Gargarizer. And that's where they get the silly name gargoyles. Sophie had never again been afraid. The fond memory caused Sophie a pang of sadness as the harsh reality of the murder gripped her again. Grand Purr is gone. She pictured the cryptex under the divan and wondered if Lee Teabing would have any idea how to open it. Or if we even should ask him. Sophie's grandfather's final words had instructed her to find Robert Langdon. He had said nothing about involving anyone else. We needed somewhere to hide, Sophie said, deciding to trust Robert's judgment. Sir Robert. A voice bellowed somewhere behind them. I see you travel with a maiden. Langdon stood up. Sophie jumped to her feet as well. The voice had come from the top of a curled staircase that snaked up to the shadows of the second floor. At the top of the stairs, a form moved in the shadows, only his silhouette visible. Good evening, Langdon called up. Sir Lee, may I present Sophie Navu? An honor. Teabing moved into the light. Thank you for having us, Sophie said, now seeing the man wore metal leg braces and used crutches. He was coming down one stair at a time. I realize it's quite late. It is so late, my dear, it's early. He laughed. Vunet's paw American? Sophie shook her head. Parisian. Your English is superb. Thank you. I studied at the Royal Holloway. So then, that explains it. Teabing hobbled lower through the shadows. Perhaps Robert told you I schooled just down the road at Oxford. Teabing fixed Langdon with a devilish smile. Of course, I also applied to Harvard as my safety school. Their host arrived at the bottom of the stairs, appearing to Sophie no more like a knight than Sir Elton John. Portly and ruby-faced, Sir Lee Teabing had bushy red hair and jovial hazel eyes that seemed to twinkle as he spoke. He wore pleated pants and a roomy silk shirt under a paisley vest. Despite the aluminum braces on his legs, he carried himself with a resilient, vertical dignity that seemed more a byproduct of noble ancestry than any kind of conscious effort. Teabing arrived and extended a hand to Langdon. Robert, you've lost weight. Langdon grinned. And you've found some. Teabing laughed heartily, patting his rotund belly. Touché. My only carnal pleasures these days seem to be culinary. Turning now to Sophie, he gently took her hand, bowing his head slightly, breathing lightly on her fingers, and diverting his eyes. Lady. Sophie glanced at Langdon, uncertain whether she'd stepped back in time or into a nuthouse. The butler who had answered the door now entered carrying a tea service, which he arranged on a table in front of the fireplace. This is Remili Galudek, Teabing said, my manservant. The slender butler gave a stiff nod and disappeared yet again. Remy's Lione eyes, Teabing whispered, as if it were an unfortunate disease. But he does sauces quite nicely. Langdon looked amused. I would have thought you'd import an English staff? Good heavens, no. I would not wish a British chef on anyone except the French tax collectors. He glanced over at Sophie. Pardon as moi, Mademoiselle de Vu. Please be assured that my distaste for the French extends only to politics and the soccer pitch. Your government steals my money, and your football squad recently humiliated us. Sophie offered an easy smile. Teabing eyed her a moment and then looked at Langdon. Something has happened. You both look shaken. Langdon nodded. We've had an interesting night, Lee. No doubt. You arrive on my doorstep unannounced in the middle of the night speaking of the Grail. Tell me, is this indeed about the Grail, or did you simply say that because you know it is the lone topic for which I would rouse myself in the middle of the night? A little of both, Sophie thought, picturing the cryptex hidden beneath the couch. Lee, Langdon said, 
We'd like to talk to you about the Priory of Sion. Teabing's bushy eyebrows arched with intrigue. The Keepers. So this is indeed about the Grail. You say you come with information? Something new, Robert? Perhaps. We're not quite sure. We might have a better idea if we could get some information from you first. Teabing wagged his finger. Ever the wily American. A game of quid pro quo. Very well. I am at your service. What is it I can tell you? Langdon sighed. I was hoping you would be kind enough to explain to Miss Davu the true nature of the Holy Grail. Teabing looked stunned. She doesn't know? Langdon shook his head. The smile that grew on Teabing's face was almost obscene. Robert, you've brought me a virgin? Langdon winced, glancing at Sophie. Virgin is the term Grail enthusiasts use to describe anyone who has never heard the true Grail story. Teabing turned eagerly to Sophie. How much do you know, my dear? Sophie quickly outlined what Langdon had explained earlier, the Priory of Sion, the Knights Templar, the Sangreal documents, and the Holy Grail, which many claimed was not a cup, but rather something far more powerful. That's all? Teabing fired Langdon a scandalous look. Robert, I thought you were a gentleman. You've robbed her of the climax. I know, I thought perhaps you and I could. Langdon apparently decided the unseemly metaphor had gone far enough. Teabing already had Sophie locked in his twinkling gaze. You are a grail virgin, my dear. And trust me, you will never forget your first time.